Welcome and thank you for joining us today uh, with our event. Um, I do want to say um, for everybody that we're going to be having a conversation um, with our great um, invitees. We have um, today with us, we have um, Tony Abu. He is the chairman of Blaze Channel US, USA and Atlantic Board Digital Communications. And for four years, Abdullah has propagated African culture and business opportunities in the US. Abdullah's film credits include American Dream, Superstar, um, Superstar Spellbound, and Crazy Like a Fox, which was nominated in the best film category at the American uh, Black Film Festival in Hollywood. With us today is also Ozahon Akpata, is a former um, McKinsey consultant who is a writer, producer, banker, um, who served as a project director of IQDIS Nollywood Portraits of Radical Beauty. Ozahon is a contributor to magazines and blogs, including Vogue Italia, Forbes, Af uh, Forbes Africa, Mail and Guardian, Next Billion, and others. So welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we'll be discussing the um, film um, Anthony's uh, film, Dr. Bello, and we'll have a conversation. I want to remind everyone um, that the film was available on Netflix. Um, I hope everybody had a chance to see it um, before the talk, but please feel free to use the Q&A section to uh, throughout today's event. We'll be answering questions at the end, um, but you guys can use it um, at any point. So welcome, Osahom, welcome, Anthony. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and thanks for the lovely introduction, Laura. We are here today in conjunction with an exhibition of select portraits by Ike Uday, the Nigerian American artist. I first met Ike in 2014 uh, and learned that he was a celebrated artist who had developed a reputation for portraiture. And, um, you know, an artsy editorial actually even listed him as one of the masters of self portraiture, along with Rembrandt, Van Gogh, and Andy Warhol. And um, he had an interest in doing portraits of Nigerian celebrities. He had already done international celebrities such as Rihanna, Isabella Rossellini, Manolo Blahnik. And he said, you know, I'm interested in doing something with Nigerian personalities. And so I got on board as project director, like Lara said, of uh, Nollywood Portraits, Radical Beauty, of which two, uh, of the, um, two of the portraits from that body of work are on exhibition along with other select portraits by I.K. Uday at the NSU Art Museum. So if you're anywhere near uh, Fort Lauderdale, I would say please stop by that uh, museum and see the exhibition because it's, uh, it's actually quite a nice thing to see. Uh, I also would like to say thank you to, apart from IK who made this possible and I would like to thank him for that. I would like to say thank you to Tony for making time for this event and also for the part that he played in the success of Nollywood Portraits because he actually uh, was very supportive of the project and, and, and made it possible for a number of the uh, personalities that we, we were able to uh, profile in that project to be um, part of it. So thank you, Tony. And uh, so now we get back to uh, you know, Dr. Bello and what an interesting movie. But before we get into the details of it, I would like to, we would like to get to know you a little bit better. Can you tell us a little bit more about how you got into filmmaking? I mean, you've been doing this for quite a while. Uh, can you tell us how you got into it and what, what motivated you, et cetera? Thank you. Thank you very much, Osaho. Um, about uh, precisely about 40 years ago, uh, about 40 years ago, I in college, well, I was just out of college. So it's like, I think it was 1976, which is like how many 40, maybe 45, 44 years ago. Um, I, I um, had written my first script while I was in college. Um, I I wanted to shoot the film. It was, everybody thought I was crazy, you know, 45 years ago in Nigeria. So I, I went and sought a mentor. Uh, his name is uh, Chief Hubert Ogunde, who's a very, very renowned Nigerian uh, 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 theater pr practitioner, as well as a filmmaker. So uh, when I spoke to him, I was just young and he, he just, he laughed, but he saw that I was keen. And so he took me under his wing and said, well, you know what, you can't shoot a film while you're in school, uh, you're going to have to uh, get out of out of college first, and because it's going to take you like nine months to shoot your film. He took a look at my script. He, he thought it was it was it was interesting, and he said it would. Uh, I should just try to be a little more patient. Now, in eighty um, 
1980, I came to visit the US. I, I came back in 82 and I got involved in uh, the Black Filmmakers Foundation. Um, not actively, but I used to see them. And I remember Spike, Spike Lee uh, carrying uh, you know, his, his um, video projection equipment and he would be telling everybody that they should wait and watch his film. You know, at that point in time, it was, uh, I think, uh, a barber shop, we, we cut heads. And, but I was, I was very quiet. I didn't say much, you know, it, uh, it was at uh, uh, New York University. And eventually, uh, Spike made, uh, she's got to have it, inspired everybody. Uh, it was a big hit, a big success. And uh, so I decided then that um, eventually I would make films. But I started out as a publisher of a magazine called Black Ivory. Um, luckily for me, I met uh, my wife and my wife's brother-in-law was the one who actually studied film uh, uh, formally at City College of New York. And I said, hey, I'm gonna make movies. He said, well, are you gonna go study it officially? I live in Manhattan. Um, films are being shot around me every second. And so uh, sometimes I'll go hang out at, uh, on set, on location and uh, watch how they would perform. And then I got, I got a little more interested in it. And Melvin, my brother-in-law, was kind enough to give me all his books for four years in film, film school. And I read all the films, um, the, 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 the books. And of course, I had studied illustration, graphic design illustration. And so it was, it was, I just got into it seamlessly. So what was being explained in the books, I could visualize them. And that's how I eventually got into filmmaking and I started making movies. That's fantastic. You, you have a very fascinating background and have made several movies. I remember meeting you in New York when you had just released the critically acclaimed film Crazy Like a Fox. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> you know, at that time, you know, I, I saw quite a bit about what you were doing. But can you tell me a little bit about what kind of challenges did, did you see uh, making film in the US compared to making film in Nigeria, which you've also done? Yes. Well, um, I would say that uh, both um, 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 uh, locations have uh, their own unique ch uh, challenges. It's pretty. It's pretty easy because uh, the the environment is 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 friendly. You know, you you people are used to shooting. You have Nollywood that shoots almost uh, forty movies a week, and I, I I grew up in Lagos, so and that is the heart of Nollywood. So you, there's always shouldn't go going on. So people are used to it. Uh, that's on the one hand. On the other hand, um, you 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 could get locations easily because you call, call your friends. You know, I want to shoot in your house, and they would say, uh, okay, how long is it going to take? It's going to take two days. Okay, come in and shoot. So you didn't have to pay for most locations and stuff like that. So the only drawback with Nigeria is that uh, sometimes you would have um, people who are. Uh, are not uh, rich people who are kind of poor, especially if you're shooting in the poor neighborhoods, and they come and beg you for 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 some sort of handout. You know, so you will try to see what you can do, and sometimes you will get some street urchins that are not as friendly. Would I would almost th threaten you that okay, we're gonna steal your camera. So if you don't find us something, so so you try to make sure everybody's happy. You take care of them, and then. And they wouldn't join in the in the in the crew to help you carry equipment, you know, and stuff like that. So that's shooting in Nigeria. I would say it's a beautiful uh, environment to shoot your film in. You know, uh, people want to be extras for for free. You know, uh, whereas in America you have two ways of shooting movies. You have these uh, Screen Actors Guild uh, SAG films, um, which are more or less the official Hollywood type films, and then you have the non-SAG films. The non-SAG films are the films that that uh, just four people in the crew, the director, uh, you know, the camera operator, the sound man, and that's it. And, and, and then you guys are running and gunning, you know, without, uh, you know, trying to um, get uh, noticed. So a, a few people shoot films like that, budgets of about $100,000. But when your film gets to a million dollars, uh, there's no way you can do that. You have to get all the permits. You have to get uh, um, um, Screen Actors Guild of America. It, it becomes extremely, extremely cumbersome. Uh, and then it involves a lot of, of, of money, a lot of budget, which actually doesn't go to the film. It goes to uh, the institutions. Then you now find that, that uh, your actors, there's a minimum budget 
for, for the actors. Then you have the, the union coming in to say that, well, the actors can only work a certain amount of time and there's a minimum amount of money, uh, 800 and something to $1,000 per hour that you go over a, a particular actor's uh, uh, um, thing. So yeah, that's why Hollywood movies uh, cost a lot of money. I've done both. I started out doing the running and gunning non-SAG and eventually I, I got up to um, the, the, the SAG movies where you get all the permissions, like I said, and, uh, and pay the, the, the uh, prerequisite fees. So that's basically the, the difference. You know, um, so most of my movies, ironically, I shoot the same uh, movie title in the two locations. So I'll shoot in, in, in the US, like as, as I did in Dr. Bello, and I will also shoot in Nigeria. You know, and then in Nigeria, I don't only shoot my movies in Lagos. Um, I shoot sometimes in 12 cities um, or as, as part of a particular title movie. So it's, it's, it's not easy. So, uh, but we do it. Sometimes we run out of money. Sometimes uh, we, we stuck at 2 a.m. in the morning in traveling, like you go into uh, some hinterland and uh, you have five trucks all lined up and uh, gasoline empties in all the trucks at 3 a.m. in the morning, in the middle of nowhere in, in Ekiti or Idori. So I've experienced it all over like a, almost like a 30 year uh, period. So that's basically it. Very, very interesting and um, a lot to learn there. Now, Nollywood, Nigeria's film industry is celebrated as the second largest film industry by number of titles released. Yes. Uh, it's independent filmmaking by Nigerians for everyone, for the global audience. What do you think are the key factors behind its success? First of all, the Nigerians, you look at the Nigerian personality. The Nigerians have a never say die attitude. You can't stop them. So it's innate in every Nigerian. So growing up in Nigeria, we're not, you, 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 you can't give excuses at all. So if you, if you have a, a plan to do something, you find a way to get it done. So in every, in every sphere in Nigeria. So that's why you have the best uh, uh, people who, are the, who have the best education on the planet. You have the best medical doctors on the planet. You, so, so everyone is driven to succeed in Nigeria. So with that as a background, we, we then had um, some people of the, 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 they're actually two ethnic groups that make all those movies. The first started out in the Yoruba uh, section, which is uh, Lagos mostly and the Western part of Nigeria. And of course, I told you uh, 45 years ago, the doyen of that, of that whole thing was my mentor. So I used to go hang out with him in Lagos. And he, he taught me most of the ideas, how to think, how to visualize uh, uh, and how to be authentic, which is something that is a bit missing today. So um, then you have the egos who are actually entrepreneurs that are known to be entrepreneurs. Uh, uh, maybe not, they, at a certain point in time, they were not into movies. But um, fortuitously, someone had imported a bunch of uh, VHS tapes and, and uh, he didn't know what to do with it. So um, one of the Nollywood early practitioners convinced him that, look, I can create content and we'll put it on it and people will buy. And he reluctantly agreed. And like magic, they sold over 500,000 copies of VHS. That was the beginning of contemporary, no, uh, uh, well, traditional Nollywood as we, as we know it, which started about 25 years ago. So once, and then of course the, the technology, the availability of the technology of the digital camera. When I started out, it was 35 mm, you know, uh, it was celluloid film and it was, strictly for just 10 people maximum in the nation. But with the advent and, and infusion of digital technology, uh, the digital cameras, everybody became a filmmaker in Nigeria. So that's how we started. And before you knew what was happening, we, the numbers grew exponentially in terms of, of the number of movies that were being made. And we became the second largest film industry on the planet with over 5,000 film titles per year. Obviously, uh, the budgets were smaller budgets, but the critical element was that Nigerians love their own stories. They love their own movies. So they supported their own movies. So it took a while, 20 years, 
before people like us started making movies to take on the international Yes, yeah, so tell me more about that. You, you, yeah. In the early 2000s, you organized this um, visit of about 50 Nollywood personalities to the US. What made, it, what made you do that? What motivated that effort? And how has the popularity of the industry's content spread uh, since that time uh, across the world? Well, you know, every, every human being has uh, what, something that drives them. Mine is, um, of course, I'm a, I'm a trained artist, but my main preoccupation has always been Afrocentrism. And Afrocentrism for me uh, was introduced to me by the musician Fela and Nicola Kukuti. He takes the credit because in Nigeria, uh, in 1976, 77, nobody was talking about anything Afrocentric. Nigerians were not really uh, uh, privy to what was going on to Blacks all over the world. We were lucky to get Fela, and he gave us all the books, and we read all the books. He would come to every university and would advise us to get to know what it means to be an African in the, in the world um, uh, you know, at that time. So a few of us took it seriously, and I started my magazine in Nigeria in 1982, uh, Black Ivory, uh, the Pan-African magazine, which when I came to the US and I continued for another 20 years, so for me, I wanted to bridge a gap between Blacks all over the world. We don't say Blacks, we say Africans all over the world. Africans born in America, Africans are born on the continent, Africans in Europe, Africans in Cuba, Africans in Brazil, Af Africans in the Caribbean. It's all one people. And ironically, 35% of African-Americans uh, trace that, their DNA ancestry to Nigeria. So we're all one people. So for me, what is important is, is a coalition of appreciation of that culture, which of course has been, has been bastardized in some places, has been decimated in other places. Uh, my, my objective and my goal is to try to bring all that together. That is my main prime uh, uh, objective. Now, the second part of it is in order for me to actualize that, it is very, very important for me to find a way to, to empower young Africans. So to empower young Africans, it means it's, it, it's not just to talk to them. You have to create opportunities for them, uh, viable opportunities for them to be able to sustain their, their families and, and their own lives. So that's what I've been, that has been my preoccupation. So as part of that movement, as part of that agenda, that plan, I decide, I, I, I visualize that the best way to do it will be to go through the creative industry, which in most cases has not received the kind of support that it's supposed to get in Africa. That is where 99% of African youth, that is their domain. And this is where they can thrive. This is where their talent is. Unfortunately, Africa has not been able to harness it, has not been able to use it for empowerment. The Nigerian government is, 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 has realized it and are beginning to work towards that direction. And we thank uh, the authorities that they're beginning to realize it. So for me, I more or less champion that cause. And I, I, I have created ways by which through the creative industry and monetizing it, we can save First and foremost, 100 million youth in Nigeria, 500 million youth in Africa, and the rest of the world. That's why I decided to bring Nollywood to the US. And as, as, um, as a, a major symbol of, of, of discipline, a major symbol of creativity, and a major symbol of talent. So they were the right representatives to do. And also, it inspired them that you mean what we do, like what we say in Nigeria, like play, play, like chance play, it's been noticed all over the world and it's been recognized all over the world. So it, it, on both sides of it, it worked. So they had the Voice of America interview them, the New York Times, the you know CNN and on and on. And people who paid hundred dollars just to see their faces, I had to shut down the event five minutes into the event because the New York City cops, was screaming that I would shut, I should shut it down. The place went crazy, you know, and that's the kind of reception that they, they received in 2004 when I brought them to the US. Very good. You and then to, the, to, answer, to answer the second part of your question, sure. that how has that um, 
um, uh, influence uh, the goings on and the developments. Um, I think that uh, it did a lot. As a matter of fact, in, 2000, in, in 2005, we had to uh, organize uh, a copyright conference between uh, the US government and the Nigerian government. It got so heavy that people started um, uh, uh, bootlegging the movies. <laughs> you understand? Uh, um, um, people were selling Nigerian uh, VHS tapes all over the place. And then that infringed on their rights. And then at the same time, started dwindling their returns. So. Um, I approached the the uh, the uh, Brooklyn District Attorney's Office, and they were so so wonderful. And they came and conducted a raid in 2010, and uh, brought all the TV outlets and uh, helped Nollywood to be more established in the U.S. and be more official. Um, I would say that there are certain things that we've done. Nollywood today, uh, if you go on Netflix, I think these are part of the things that made. Uh, an, uh, an outfit like Netflix come into Nigeria and set up base in Nigeria. Um, and now you go on Netflix and you see all the Nigerian movies. The quality of the, of the movies have improved tremendously. The budgets have gone to millions of dollars in some of the productions. And we have excellent quality studios that are there now that are indigenously in Nigeria. So um, I would say that this has been a great thing. Uh, there are a couple of uh, things I would have loved to have better. I would, like I said, I would prefer that I would, I would have loved the government to the federal government to really step in and then they can fast track what is happening. Um, some of us are lo lobbying. Uh, it's not easy in Africa because there are so many things the government has to take care of. But um, I think that we're beginning to get the kind of results that would uh, uh, get us to where we're supposed to be globally. That's quite good. And you obviously have very good relationships in the film industry. Uh, and we're able to bring together some of the biggest names in Nollywood, such as Genevieve Naji and Stephanie Okirike Linus, uh, as well as some of the, a couple of recognizable Hollywood stars like Isaiah Washington and Vivica Fox together for this movie, Dr. Balaam. Yeah. Can you tell us more about how this ensemble cast came together? Well, um, first of all, I, I, I would like to thank Isaiah Washington. I would like to thank Vivica A. Fox, and I would like to thank Jimmy John Louis, as well as a lot of others, Ben Cohen, and so on. And the reason being, when you want to make a Hollywood film, the average Hollywood film today, let me just give an example. Black Panther, that everybody watched, was $200 million. That's the budget. And that didn't include the PA, which is the advertising budget, and another hundred million dollars. So for you to get a movie of that quality, um, 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 Disney had to invest about $300 million for that one movie. When I was going to make Dr. Bello, I didn't have any budget. I had zero budget. But I knew that the story had to be told. And sometimes I'm also. Uh, I would say I'm, I'm kind of spiritual. So I, I leave everything in the hands of God. I, I say, well, this is important. If you like me to do this stuff, I don't have a dime. Um, somewhere along the line, maybe you can bring somebody to help me. That's, that's my, my general philosophy. So I'd written the script. Um, no, actually, I'd not written the script. And all of a sudden, I get a phone call from Isaiah Washington, who was uh, a superstar on uh, Grey's Anatomy at that time. He had just signed a $25 million uh, uh, deal. And he called me, he said, uh, I'd like to speak to Tony Abulu. I said, well, speaking. He said, um, your name was given to me, uh, you know, as a, a top African producer. I would like you to come and produce the film that, I want, that, I'm, that I'm trying to produce. I said, okay, what's, what's that film? He said, I want to use it to help the country of Syria Leone. He said, because I just did my DNA testing and I found out that my ancestors come from Syria Leone. And I, I, I went over there, I tried the best I could. I built uh, a few schools, I built a few hospitals. Personally, I want to go and see how I can create a sustainable income for them. And I want to replicate what you guys are doing 
in Nigeria, in Nollywood, and do that over there. And I would like you to come and be my partner to do. And uh, he talked to me about the movie, and I said, well, Isaiah, I think we can do that, but, because, but that's going to be a much bu uh, larger budget film. In the meantime, I have another film that I want to do called Dr. Baylor. He said, oh, I've done so many movies about playing a medical doctor, I don't want to do that no more. So I kept on, and a few people spoke to him, and he said, okay, send me the script. I sent him half a page of the treatment of Dr. Bellow. And he just said, you know what? You found yourself, your, your Michael, Dr. Michael Durant. So these are some of the reasons why I'm saying we have to thank some of these actors because we don't have their budget at all. But based on the fact that they want to help out, based on if many of them are, are doing their DNA testing and they say, look, how can we help Africa? Maybe we can do that by lending our, our fame, by lending our, our, our experience to support them. This, that's what happened in my case. So um, Isaiah Washington came on board. I, I went out to look for Vivica Fox, you know, and pleaded and the same thing said, you know what, Tony, don't worry about it, I'll come do it. How many days is it, you know? And then I tried to limit the number of days so that uh, I don't put them out too much. And then Jimmy John Louis, who's in my uh, opinion, the, the, the one of the fastest rising actors in, in Hollywood. And, um, and obviously most renowned actor, Caribbean uh, actor from Haiti uh, in Hollywood. Uh, he said, hey, Tony, come on, let's do this. And we, we, I got them together, I brought in some other people. I went to look for money. Uh, I was running around the whole place in Nigeria. And luckily I was able to get something that was enough for, just enough for us to shoot the film. And gradually, it took a while and uh, we were able to make the movie. Today, the movie is on Netflix. Fantastic. It takes a tremendous amount of effort to wrap a film like Dr. Bello, and we congratulate you for this accomplishment. Yes. As a filmmaker, the job continues after that final cut, though, as you yes. start securing distribution. Can you tell us a little bit about the distribution journey of Dr. Bello? Hmm. Uh, for any filmmaker who's starting more or less, like you want to make a Hollywood type film, um, it's a totally different ball game. The distribution part of it, you can make the movie. One thing is to make the film. Another thing is to get the film distributed, as a lot of people are beginning to find out now. Um, remember, our earlier movies, we distributed them ourselves. And we did thousands and hundreds of thousands of DVDs. You know, and we, we as president of the Filmmakers Association of Nigeria in the US, um, I created that. And I had a team, and we had outlets to distribute those films. Now, making a movie like a Dr. Bellow now calls for mainstream American uh, 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 release. So um, my friends at the Africa Diaspora Film Festival, um, who've been very close friends to, uh, of mine for years, they said, hey, Tony, how can we help you? I said, uh, do you guys know anybody in, in, uh, in in distribution. They said, well, the only person that, that we know is a young lady in AMC. If you can call her, if you can uh, you know, get to talk to her, maybe she can, you can convince her. And then I, I called the young lady and uh, she said, can you send a copy of the movie? I sent a copy of the movie. Uh, they took a look at it, they liked it, and they gave me carte blanche. It was shocking, you know, they, but the act involves p and &E, print and advertising costs in the millions of dollars. So it's not enough to get the cinema. You got to be able to promote the film. Now, we can give you the cinema, but can you go raise the money for the film? Can your country appreciate this opportunity? I said, yes. Of course, I wasn't sure. I said, yes. And I went back to Nigeria and I pleaded with the, with the nation and all that. And they said, well, we can, the best we can do is half a million dollars. So, well, let's go try. So I came back, we had it all over the cinemas, but we didn't have enough uh, to get people to know about. It. Now, of course, all the monies you've raised, all your investors, they want to cut off your head. They hate your guts. They're saying that where's their money? They're screaming. Some are calling you crooks. Some are calling the cops, <laughs> you know, because they don't care, all they want is the returns on their money. Now, somewhere along the line, 
somewhere you got to be steadfast you got to be prayerful somewhere along the line um i decided that i would try to get the movie into netflix which at the same point in time the digital domain especially with the covid uh, uh pandemic uh nobody was going to all the cinemas are shut down and i had to get the movie out so um we i got we started looking for a distributor what is called an aggregator because netflix never takes the movie directly you got to go through aggregators now the aggregator that we got that we heard of that was the greatest ag aggregator and the the main aggregator to netflix we approached them and they said they saw the film and they loved the film and they said you know what and this of course was in hollywood they said uh, why don't you uh pay for the basic things that you need to do um so that we can get it to to try to get it uh to the eyeballs of netflix and if they like it then they will accept it lo and behold that company after all the payments filed for bankruptcy and over 1000 american filmmakers were left stranded including yours truly and we couldn't get our money back but nobody could get anything so i said okay what's next luckily like i said before netflix is in nigeria now which is unusual so i approached netflix through my my contact my guys in nigeria and of course netflix uh, uh um, um acquisition uh quality the, what we call the q and the, the, the qc the quality control it's very 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 high so if your film is good enough they take a look at your film if they like it they make you an offer that's how we got on that interesting so in the movie an american doctor makes a journey to nigeria in search of a cure for cancer what is the hidden message you're trying to get across uh, to the audience with the storyline of dr bailey well i uh, i mentioned earlier that uh, one of my main uh, driving force preoccupation is afrocentrism and i i spent spent some time to explain that another aspect is this in my considered opinion africa's greatest asset greatest asset bigger than oil diamond you name it it is nature cure growing up in africa my grandmother was a princess who knew a lot about nature cure and most people i'm sure also you would you would have some some of your uh, older generation your 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 grandparents who would tell you that oh you you have this uh, malaria why don't you just mix this herb with that and that and that and, and guess what you'll be fine so every single african knows that but the way things are in africa they have relegated their their their, their greatest asset and their potential because they believe that why do you have to reinvent the wheel the caucasians the americans the the chinese they've already created the 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 products all we got to do is buy them and i'm of a totally different opinion different uh, philosophy i said why do we we are we for in my in my understanding the garden of eden in the bible is actually africa so <laughs> that's where that's where the best weather is that's where the best mineral resources is the best plant life on the planet there's no 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 tsunami no snow no uh, uh uh forest fires nothing perfect pristine the temperature is the best on the planet why do we have to relegate the role of helping the world and not do it so when you want to teach the best way i believe to do it is not to fight or scream and start fighting everybody show it so i said okay i'm going to write a movie about it and that's what that's why i wrote the story of an african american who comes in contact with a nature cure expert who's also a medical doctor in this case from nigeria who heals a boy of cancer and he's arrested because there's a spiritual involvement where he cannot disclose the the source of the elixir and 
the African-American oncologist, one of the best in the country, now has to go to Africa to look for it. And that's the story of Dr. Bell. The story of nature cure and its untapped opportunities in Africa. So I was privileged to be able to attend the premiere of Dr. Bello in Lagos. How do you think the movie was received in Nigeria? And now that it is on Netflix, what early feedback are you getting uh, from the global audience? Well, um, during the premiere and the theatrical release in Africa, people were sitting two per seat. <laughs> in the cinema, and each seat for one person, we had two people sitting on that seat because the anticipation, the government itself was using the opportunity to say, hey, this is the first film we funded and it's ready and it has all these American stars, we, you know, they blew, it up, they blew it up. So people wanted to see. Now, after they saw the film, and of course I knew how the reaction was going to be. A lot of people were disappointed. A lot of people felt that, why would you tell a story about nature cure? Why would you tell a story about indi indigenous African religion and culture when we're all born again Christians, when we're all born again uh, 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 Islam adher adherents? Why are you trying to go back? Why are you, why are you revealing a fetish Africa? So a lot of people felt really disappointed. And it was shocking that Nigerian pharmacists, I'm talking about leadership of the pharmacology industry, they, they didn't want to see. A lot of them told me that they're not going to watch the film because it's not in the Bible that man should communicate with plants, which was what was in Dr. Bello. And of course, like I said, I knew this because we all know that we'll be colonized. We all know that we've been sub subjugated mentally. And so it takes a lot for an African to, to realize their own value. And at the same time, it takes, a, we've been told not to visit, to revisit traditional Africa, you know, and of course now we know the reasons, but I'm gonna do it irrespective. And so over a period of 10 years. It's almost 10 years now, Dr. Bill. And what you begin to find is that because now the movie is on Netflix, the Nigerians are saying, at least not all, but a majority of Nigerians are saying, wait a minute, what do the Caucasians see in this movie? Why would Netflix take this movie? And then on the other side, in the US, the kind of response we are getting is that this is the most important African document that we have seen so far. Articles have been written in, in, in the Amsterdam News, in uh, Psychology Today, in the New York Times, about the, the, not just the quality, but the, the depth and essence of the story and how it relates to Africa finding itself against all odds. So it's like a double-edged double sword. So the, the, in America, it's fantastic, it's great. In Africa, they're just beginning to see the value after 10 years. So when you look back at the process you went through to make Dr. Bailo, are there things that you would do differently if you could do it again? And what key lessons have you learned uh, from making this movie? Well, if I will do it again, I won't do it. <laughs> because it took me uh, almost 10 years. Um, of, of, I actually lost my mother's home, the home I built for my mother. My mother is 90 years old. I, I, had to, um, I had to, my mom had to become homeless for three years. Um, um, the banks had to repossess the home because that's what I use as collateral for the money. Um, it was terrible, you know, it, it was disastrous. Some of the individual investors 
um, I, I lost a lot of friends, friends of over 40 years. You know, they, they, they just felt that I, I, I wasted the opportunity. And of course, uh, there are many movies in Nigeria that are shot um, in the Nigerian style, in the Nigerian motif, in the Nigerian contemporary ideology that did very well. Uh, doing a million dollars, you know, and, and so on and so forth in Nigeria. And so they're looking at me and saying, Tony, you could run circles around all these people. Why would you go tell a story that you knew yourself knew that, uh, you know, would, would create problems? And so um, if I had to do it all over again, I'd do it. <laughs> I'll do it again because of who I am and because of the, 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 the value that it carries. Maybe in the first 10 years, you lose out. Let me give you an example. My very first film I shot is Back to Africa. I shot it in 1997, right? And I came to the US and I sent it out to film festivals. And I sent it to the Newark uh, Film Festival and they rejected the movie three years in a row. And I had to pay to get the movie. 10 years later, I was in, they discovered the movie <laughs> and I was invited and I was given a five course meal with a hundred of the most distinguished African-American community in, in, in the state of New Jersey. And after we had that dinner, they took me into the scene, the theater itself and there were 500 people in the scene 10 years later. What I've learned is, uh, especially in the black community, things take time. Create the art and let the art speak for itself. Art is timeless. It is not something that you use some attire or car or material thing. It is art. It is everlasting. So tell the story, create the art, and you may wind up dead, you know, without being uh, um, known or celebrated or whatever, but eventually, the art will, will, will do its job, will succeed in raising the intellect, raising the spirituality, and raising the quality of the people that it was meant for. Very, very, very profound. Uh, before I go to my final question, I just want to remind the audience that they can ask questions using the Q&A link on the um, Zoom, the Q&A section of Zoom. On, uh, that's going on right now. So please feel free to write your questions in there and Laura will ask those questions as we go along. But my final question for you, Tony, is what's next for Tony Abulu in the world of creativity and filmmaking? Well, I'll talk about film first. Um, I'm working just in the same light of, uh, of Dr. Bello. Dr. Bello was actually a teaser of what to come. Uh, my stories are not mundane stories. I've, I've done mundane stories, but you know, as film. But my preoccupation, I think I'll be doing the world a disservice if I don't tell the kind of story that I'm supposed to tell based on my nurturing, nature and nurture in the continent, growing up with, a, with two princesses, my grandmother on my maternal side, my grandmother on my paternal side of information when I was growing up from when I was two, three. Now, my next movie is called Afterlife. It's what happens when you're dead. Everybody dies. Has anybody ever made a movie about what happens when somebody's dead? Well, I have some information that I would like to impart <laughs> you know, to the world. That movie is a lot bigger budget. And like Dr. Bello, uh, you know, I believe that my stories, the stories I tell are, are not picked by me. They, 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 I, I get some sort of divine inspiration. And so Afterlife is the ultimate divine inspiration. That's the movie that I'm doing next. Afterlife, what happens when you're dead? Now, on that side, on the other side of creativity, I have um, created an, an opportunity. It took me 25 years, um, digital monetization of the African creative industry. Well, we don't have to keep going to beg everybody. We have to beg. You know, Africans, you know, we've been begging for a long time. I think it's high time that we have to create our own 
uh, monetization opportunities and sustenance opportunities. I've, I think I've found that uh, solution now. It's taken me a long time, but I've been able to uh, uh, get and find that solution. Great. Okay. So that's it for me with the questions that I have. Um, Laura, are you still there? And, um, yeah. Okay, great. Um, Hi, everyone. So, um, yeah. Yes, okay, so how's it going? I, we do have some questions. Um, first, um, our director and chief curator, Bonnie Claire Water, she's joining us today and she's asking, uh, first of all, like the conversation was fantastic, but uh, can you describe the contrast? Can you contrast the development of narrative in Nollywood films and Hollywood films? Well, Hollywood films, in my um, considered opinion, um, are mostly, mostly, not all, or mostly um, practical monetization films. They're made for the bottom line. They're made for money. So they tell, the, the stories in most cases are, are, are very elementary, you know, because the audience is young. So they focus on the audience and tell stories that are very elementary stories. Once in a while, you will see some stories. For instance, uh, one of my best stories is, um, is um, uh, the Green Mile, for instance. So uh, once in a while you see a film that, that has uh, some deep intrinsic value. But on the whole, uh, Hollywood films are very simple, basic films, you know, in terms of, of, of storyline. Um, not Hollywood films are basically the same because the average Hollywood film it's like twenty thousand dollars. You know, what are you gonna do with twenty thousand dollars? But they do it. They tell the story. Boy meets girl. The mother doesn't like the girl, um, and um, here comes a pastor who saves the day. You know, so. But there are some filmmakers in Nigeria, in Nollywood, and I can mention at least ten that have supreme quality. Um, Bollywood Indian films, oh, they're going to break out in a song and dance. Oh, look at them, look at them. They're going to break out in a song and dance now. But the second most viable actor on the planet is an Indian actor. You know what I mean? So uh, uh, they love their films. They 1.6 billion people. They don't need anybody else. We are 200 million people. We're managing. But the stories are there. And I believe that if People who want to see true filmmaking. Filmmaking is not just about aesthetics. Filmmaking is actually about depth of the human personality and the human spirit. We don't see that. It's very, very rare. Thank you. That is great. Um, <laughs> we have another one. It's like, what, um, I'm not sure if you know this, but what percentage of all Nigerian films produced uh, you think make it to the US? Uh, maybe like, and of course it's Netflix. Um, I would say maybe like, uh, let me, let me be, <laughs> let me just be modest. Maybe like 2%. Yeah, because the movies that go to Netflix, the budgets are average um, $100,000 to a million dollars. So, and that budget, the Nigerians can't, can't uh, cool that budget. Majority of Nollywood movies are shared with $10,000 and $20,000. 5,000 movies are shot with that budget. If you can believe that someone can shoot a movie with $10,000, trust me, there are 1,000 Nigerian movies that are shot with $10,000 as a total budget. So, uh, but the ones that are especially $500,000 and above, uh, I think we'll just be like uh, 1% um, of, of, of the number of movies that are shot in Nigeria that get to the US, yes. I think there's a lot more for us, you know, to, to learn and, and, and watch, I think. Um, I, I'm curious, you know, um, have you heard, I, you, you were mentioning a lot of um, the African diaspora and, and we know a lot of that in, you know, here in the US. Yeah. Um, and it goes throughout many cultures, right? Like you have like African America, uh, Latin America, Caribbean. I'm, I'm wondering, have, uh, since the film carries a lot of um, spirituality and, and, you know, looking back, like you mentioned, have, have you received any feedback of how, you know, as, as 
how is it that people who who have that in in their sessions like in in the african diaspora how is that the, that part of the film received well i'm i'm really very humbled sometimes i listen to people from the caribbean from spain from several cultures and and i'm i'm i, I can't even say nothing i'm humbled they begin to tell me similarities in the in the in the in the culture they begin to tell me similarities in, this, in the, the appreciation and understanding of, of, of spirituality. They begin to say to me that, wow, we never knew that Africans were this deep. <laughs> you understand? We just thought Africans wanted to ride fancy cars. The, the thing about it is this. You have a lot of people in the world that are spiritual. A lot. They don't have a lot of money. They're poor. You can be physically, you can be materially poor, but you, you can be spiritually rich. And I appreciate their support. It, it, it tells me that, I, you know, all the, all the negatives that I experienced making the movie was not in vain. You know, I, my, my efforts were not in vain. And so when I call my mom and say, listen, I send my mom, for instance, a, a writer. <laughs> from someone, my mom just started laughing because she's a she's a deeply spiritual woman. She says, I, I told you, it may take time, but the people that will understand your film will understand your film. So it's been a very, very, very inspiring and, and positive um, um, response from people all around the world. Great, that's wonderful to hear. Um, and then um, I have another question and also uh, from a director. Can you talk about um, Aikido's photograph role in bringing attention to Nollywood worldwide? Well, um, I've tried for like 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> I've been at it for like 20 years. Uh, part of it was the reason why um, we brought 50 of the Nollywood stars to the US. Um, unfortunately, Africa is seen as some place that's not on the planet. You know, uh, Africa is uh, really relegated. Uh, Africa is seen as a place where, uh, you know, as a place that, uh, like a forsaken place, kind of. And, 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 and they're be, being judged materially. And the Africans themselves, unfortunately, don't realize it. Until you come to live in a place like America, or you live in the Western world, then you begin to wonder why, why are they, because in Africa, you don't even realize you, you don't know that you're black. There's nothing like that. It's where you come to, you don't understand it. So Africa needs help and the help is not coming. It's taken me 40 years in America to realize that the help is not coming. And, it's, and I've realized that if, there's, if that help is gonna come, it has to come from either myself as an individual or anybody that that is thinking the way I'm thinking. And trust me, it's been very, very difficult. I haven't, I've, I haven't found three people that think the way I think. So the African governments that are supposed to do it are busy trying to show up what they consider to be contemporary, modernized living. So they, they base all their effort on infrastructure. But if the, if the morality, which we're beginning to see in the youth now, because we're beginning to see African youth commit suicide for the first time ever, young Africans are committing suicide today. Never ever heard of before in, in the history of Africa. What you're beginning to see is that while the governments are busy looking at trying to be like Europe, trying to be like America in terms of modern amenities, in terms of infrastructure, their people are dying. And so the funding is not coming from the African government. The funding is not coming from anywhere outside the world. Somebody has to go it out. And that's what I set out for 40 years to do. And that's why I said to you, I found it eventually. And so if I'm still alive for, for a minute, um, I think we'll begin to see a little bit of difference. And the money is not coming from, from, from any World Bank or whatever. 
the money is coming from the Africans themselves, who are spending that money, especially through their diaspora, and, and they are so nonchalant as to what that money can really do and how it can, how it can be utilized to save the rest of Africa. So some of us are on that journey, and uh, hopefully soon uh, we will be able to, to um, actualize real things that will make a difference. And uh, when we talk about, you know, we're, we're doing the event, I know, in conjunction with um, IQ um, selective portraits we, we currently have at the museum. Um, and in a similar way, can you describe how, you know, he's also, um, his role photographing um, Nollywood uh, and Nollywood stars like, like yourself, Tony, like um, how is the, the, the photograph's role is bringing attention to Nollywood worldwide as well? Well, uh, thank God we have people like Osaho, we have people like Ike Ude, and, and um, some Africans who have been exposed to the goings on in a place like America. Ike is a world renowned artist photographer. He has garnered so much uh, respect and accolade. I've known Ike for almost 40 years in New York City. And while he was busy doing his, 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 uh, his, uh, his, his photo painting uh, sp uh, specialization, I was busy uh, going into culture and propagation and all that. When he saw the efforts of what Nollywood had done with, with very little, and he says you know, to himself, how can I make a contribution? And in his, in his, in his beautiful way of thinking and selflessness, he decides, you know what? I'm going to go present Nollywood the way Nollywood is supposed to be seen. And contacted his very good friend, Osaho, who is a, an expert producer in Nigeria. And when you see Nollywood avant-garde, when you see Nollywood in such glamour and such richness in culture as presented by IK Ude, I think that people are going to look at Nollywood uh, differently. Um, so I am really, really, really appreciative of IK's commitment, his effort. And as we see, this, uh, this uh, platform we're on now, it was because of IK and Osaho. That's, that's that we're, we're, we're having it. So we have a few people among us who in their way, are making the contribution. You know, it is, it, it really think that the film, Dr. Villa really capture um, the sense of meaning. I remember in the beginning of the film, you know, he, he's asked, you know, you will risk everything, you know, for people that you yes. don't know. And I think that that is very reflective of very of the anecdotes that you guys have shared today, you know, including this collaboration between IQ and, and, and yourself and also Holland and, and how understanding the, the, the art you know, it concerts and needs to be supported and, and you guys have a beautiful community, really. Thank you very much. Um, um, yeah, so with that said, we, we don't have any questions. Um, also, Hon, will you, thank you so much for, you know, helping us coordinate this. Tony, thank you so much for joining. It. This has been a really amazing talk. Um, it really gave us a great perspective, you. Um, you know, of the artwork. Um, for everyone, I will remind that, you know, we are currently open at the museum. If you if you are in the South Florida area, um, we have an amazing um, show of IQ with a selective portraits um, currently on view. Um, thank you guys for joining us. And um, with that said, I think um, we're done unless, so thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Alara, for having us. Uh, and I really appreciate um, the work that the NSU Art Museum is doing. Thanks to Barney and the rest, uh, and the rest of the team for, for putting this together. And thank you, Tony, for making the time for this. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah.